So I wanted to start out by just asking uh, how many people have set foot on the PCT, even just for a few miles? Wow, that's a lot more than I thought. <laughs> Anybody who has through-hiked the Pacific Crest Trail? So, and I can't tell if that was a hand. One person, okay, cool. Um, I thought that might be the case as the PCT has become more and more popular in recent years, so that's very cool. Um, so through hiking is a term you all may or may not be familiar with, and that just means that you're walking a long distance hiking trail like the PCT or the Appalachian Trail in its entirety over one season, usually starting in the fall or the spring and finishing in the fall. And with the PCT, that's going to be 2,650 miles, uh, and it usually takes four to six months, depending on the hiker. Uh, so I thought I'd begin just reading a short excerpt from my book. Uh, this comes at the very end, as I was about a day away from finishing my hike. The trail pushes on, deeper into the wild and lonesome Pesaten wilderness. A cold wind rustles the grass of a small meadow and it sways from side to side. Off to the east, shafts of sunlight break through the clouds and light up small spots in the valley floor. Hovering above the surrounding peaks is a little defiant patch of blue sky. A calm pervades the scene. To the north, the trail passes through the meadow and disappears into the trees. It is the one constant view along the through hiker's journey, the trail heading ever northward. Through desert, snowy peaks, volcanoes, valleys, canyons, and sweltering tree cover. Past saplings and 700 year old fir trees. Past lakes and waterfalls and boiling mud pots past tiny mountain streams and rivers as muddy as, as the Columbia. Soon enough, though, the trail will come to an end. So at that point in my hike, I had pretty much seen the trail in its entirety. But there was, for me, a time when the Pacific Crest Trail, um, that trail heading ever northward, was simply a thin line running up and down a map of the west coast of the United States. But it was a map of the PCT as much as any photograph of the trail scenery that stoked my imagination and lured me into the ridiculous prospect of walking over 2,000 miles. And it was maps, once again, that I would use to share that story of that experience with readers. So I've been working in graphic design for over a decade, primarily designing books and magazines. I started out designing books for a small publisher in Seattle, and it was always my goal to make each book as visually interesting as possible and to find ways, whenever appropriate, to tell the author's story through visuals. Maps, just, maps were just one of the tools in my design tool belts, along with typography, illustration, and infographics. And during the time that I was cutting my teeth as a graphic designer, I was also slowly becoming more and more serious about hiking and backpacking in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. And I vividly remember the first time I stood on the PCT and I, I looked south on the trail and I imagined what it might feel like to walk all the way to that point from the Mexico border and all the scenery that would unfurl before my eyes during that long walk. I bought a map of the PCT and I hung it on the wall of my small studio apartment. I studied it each and every day as I began to plan and dream about my hike of the PCT. So, say you didn't know anything about the PCT, what could you determine about the trail just from a simple map such as this? Well, um, you can see that the course of the trail runs north to south, and it runs border to border from Mexico to Canada. You could see that it runs along the three Pacific Coast states, California, Oregon, and Washington. If you know a little bit about the western mountain ranges, uh, you probably could guess at least the two mountain ranges the main mountain ranges that it travels, the Sierra Nevada in California, and the Cascades in Oregon and Washington. Um, and people often mistakenly refer to the trail as the Pacific Coast Trail, but it's not a coastal route at all. But looking at the map, you can see two points where it is closest to the Pacific Ocean. So right in this spot here, um, you, um, you're at a point near Los Angeles where you're up in the San Gabriel Mountains at nearly 9,000 feet in, ele in elevation, and you can actually see the ocean from that point on the trail. And the second point 
is up here in Northern California, uh, just before you cross into Oregon. And in both instances, you're still about 50 to 100 miles from the coast. And those two areas that I just pointed out might also stand out to you because they're two points where the trail diverges from its mostly north to south route. Uh, down there in Southern California, um, it's because the trail follows the transverse mountain ranges of the San Bernardinos and San Gabriels, uh, which run east to west. And up there in Northern California, the trail departs the Cascades briefly to form this large horseshoe bend uh, into the Klamath Mountains in the west, and that's done in order to bypass the extremely dry and inhospitable terrain north of Mount Shasta. So I officially decided to hike the PCT in 2012, and at the very same time, I began to imagine a way that I could tell that story in book form. That was the same year that Cheryl Strayed published her uh, best-selling memoir, Wild, which details her hike of the PCT in California and Oregon uh, back in the 90s. So while Wild has been the most commercially successful about, book about the PCT, if you take a quick look on Amazon, uh, you'll, you'll find numerous other books about the trail. They run the gamut from self-published works to books published by the largest publishing houses. Um, and I often wondered my, to myself, uh, did the world really need another book about a PCT through hike? Now, most books about the PCT have a very limited audience, uh, namely other through hikers. But authors like Cheryl Strayed and Bill Bryson who uh, wrote A Walk in the Woods about the Appalachian Trail, they produced books that appealed to a more general audience, uh, readers who may possess no real interest in the pursuit of thru-hiking. Um, they're not first and foremost books about thru-hikes, rather they fit into more established and accessible genres, whether it be a humorous tra travelogue or a memoir about self-healing. But I decided I wanted to give uh, as fresh and unique a perspective on the PCT as I could. And I knew that my background in design and my love for infographics and maps could provide me with a unique, unique view of the trail that might appeal to more than just other through hikers. I began to envision a book that was the PC3, PCT through the eyes of a graphic designer. To achieve this, I knew that I would have to collect as much data as possible throughout my hike to use later on to construct all of the maps and infographics that I would make. So two of my most important pieces of the gear, alongside the obvious ones, like a tent, a sleeping bag, a water filter, were my camera, which I used to take over 5,000 photos, and a small, lightweight digital voice recorder that I used to record my thoughts uh, on not only the beauty of the trail and the people I met along the way, but also some of the most mundane details, such as my daily mileage, how many blisters formed on my feet, how many Snickers bars I ate during the entire hike. The idea was to create a book that I could not only be read cover to cover in a typical linear fashion, but one that the reader could open to any given page and become immersed in a variety of visual and written information, hopefully discovering something new each time. So, about halfway through my hike, I found a copy of John Steinbeck's Cannery Row and decided to carry it with me on the trail. I'd always wanted to read this book and thought it would be appropriate to read one of California's greatest writers while walking the length of the state. What I was surprised to discover was that the book's main character just so happened to be a long distance hiker who travels by foot from Indiana to Florida. After my hike, I continued to read as much of Steinbeck as I could, and I found all kinds of interesting overlaps between his writing and what I experienced on the trail, a lot of which I chose to include in my book. I learned that Steinbeck even lived for a brief time in the Sierra Nevada, hiking on trails and fishing in lakes that would eventually become part of the PCT's route. And I thought I'd share uh, a few quotes from him with you tonight. In his nonfiction book, Travels with Charlie, Steinbeck recounts his 1960s road trip around the United States. Here you can see the, uh, the illustrated map from the end papers of one of the first printings of that book. So in Travels with Charlie, Steinbeck writes this about maps. 
There are map people whose joy is to lavish more attention on the sheets of colored paper than on the colored land rolling by. I have listened to accounts by such travelers in which every road number was remembered, every mileage recalled, and every little countryside discovered. Another kind of traveler requires to know in terms of maps exactly where he is pinpointed at every moment, as though there were some kind of safety in black and red lines, in dotted indications in squirming blue of lakes, and the shadings that indicate mountains. It is not so with me. I was born lost and take no pleasure in being found, nor much identification from shapes which symbolize continents and states. So as much as I love Steinbeck, I do have to disagree with his uh, opinion of maps here. So knowing where I'm located on a map, knowing the whimsical names of the topographical features surrounding me, and what lies ahead all bring me immense joy. In his description of travelers who remember every road number, every mileage, every little co countryside, well, that more or less sums up my approach to this book. Which brings us to one of the first visuals in my book, a spread of infographics and data about my through hike. So some of the data here is universal to all PCT hikes, such as the highest point, which is Forester Pass in the Sierras, at 13,000 feet, seen here, and then the lowest point, which is the Columbia River at sea level, which separates Oregon from Washington. So it's easy enough to, to list the highest and lowest points in the trail, but it's much more interesting to me to see them, to see their elevation profiles next to each other like this. It really puts into perspective what a dramatic difference it is that you experience over the course of those 2,600 miles. Other data, uh, such as how many pairs of shoes it took me to get to Canada, is of course unique to my own hike. For me, I went through four pairs of shoes uh, and two pairs of pants walking from Mexico to Canada. I've also included information such as the longest I went without bathing, which was 11 days, how many blisters formed on my feet over the course of 2,500 miles, 17, and how many bears I saw during my hike, three, one of which was itself, itself hiking directly towards me on the trail. More on that a little bit later. So I open the first part of the book with this visual overview of the five regions of the PCT and include their corresponding lengths. So we start out uh, hiking south to north in, the, in Southern California with its heat, lack of water, unhindered desert vistas, and unique desert flora like the Joshua Tree. Then there's Central California, which is characterized by the alpine scenery of the Sierra Nevada. Higher elevation and potentially lots of snow. In Northern California, the intense heat returns. Oh, I think we left out one slide, but you'll just have to imagine Northern California. Um, the scenery becomes much less dramatic as hikers find themselves in the tree-covered mountains of the Cascades and Klamaths. And then here, we have Oregon, uh, which has much more gentle terrain in comparison to the rest of the PCT and is dotted with volcanic spires, numerous lakes, and swarms of bloodthirsty mosquitoes. The final section, and my personal favorite, is Washington characterized by the stunning and physically demanding North Cascades, old growth forests, and berry bushes hanging heavy with fruit. So returning to Steinbeck, I wanted to share one more quote about maps from Travels with Charlie. He writes, for weeks I had studied maps, large scale and small, but maps are not reality at all. They can be tyrants. I know people who are immersed in road maps that never see the countryside they pass through, and others who, having traced a route, are held to it as though by flanged wheels to rails. So I thought this was an interesting quote and a unique, though, again, somewhat negative perspective on maps. It's interesting that he calls maps tyrants. Um, 
I actually see maps as a democratizing force in that it can make places accessible to everyone. And that's what I hope to do with the maps and infographics I created for this book, to give someone who is un unable or uninterested in hiking the PCT a better understanding of what the trail and the experiences of through hiking might be like. And for those who have hiked the PCT, I hope these maps would give them a unique way to rel relive their time on the trail, as well as discover new things that they may not have noticed during their own hike. For me, putting together these maps in my book as a whole was a way to more deeply connect with my experiences on the trail. It gave me this wonderful gift of reliving my time hiking each and every day that I worked on the book. It's, uh, it's also interesting to note that unlike our system of roads and highways in which it can be a choose your own adventure uh, approach to getting from point A to point B, the whole reason behind through hiking the PCT is that you're sticking to one preordained route leading from Mexico to Canada. In this case, you could say that the trail itself is the tyrant. But many hikers like myself would, from time to time, cast off the yoke of the PCT's tyranny and travel on so-called alternate routes, such as the alternate route along the rim of Crater Lake, arguably one of the most scenic parts of any PCT through hike, though it departs the trail itself. So I thought I'd share just a little bit about some of the, the actual maps that I carried with me while hiking the PCT. I think a very unique aspect of through hiking a long distance trail is that from a cartographic point of view, um, is that for the average person, it's probably one of the only times in your life where you're referring to a map each and every day for multiple times a day for months on end. Um, Believe it or not, when I hiked the PCT in 2014, I actually still had a flip phone. So I used only paper maps. There were plenty of hikers then, and even more so now, I'm sure, who navigate primarily using apps on their phones, but I much preferred the old-fashioned way. Now, it would have been much too heavy to carry all the maps with me from the get-go. Uh, weight is, of course, one of the biggest concerns of any hiker. And my mom had recently retired, so I enlisted her as my support person. And one of the most important things she did was to mail me a stack of paper maps to certain points along the trail, whether they be post offices or hiker-friendly businesses. I remember it being such a joy to eat, get each new set of maps. Uh, I'd look them over, building up excitement for what was to come. And uh, each map was printed in color on your standard 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. And I go through about three of them a day, uh, covering 25 miles or so on the trail each day. So while these particular maps aren't the most aesthetically pleasing maps, I did come to love that thin red squiggle tracing its way through those low resolution topographic lines and the little blue waypoints that marked half mile increments along the trail. I would take each new pristine map and fold them twice so they would fit into my, pa my pants pocket. And by the time I was finished with each one, it was crumpled, torn, covered in dirt, and stained with sweat or blood or crushed mosquitoes. And ultimately, it would be dumped unceremoniously into the trash. Now, these particular maps were very popular during the time I hiked the PCT in 2014. And they were available to download for free uh, from a hiker named Lon Cooper. He's a retired tech professional who collaborated with a couple other folks to build a custom GPS device and software to power it. Uh, comprised of a GPS chip and antenna and controlled by an iPhone, he carried it along the trail to get a highly accurate location of the PCT and important landmarks, as well as ac accurate elevation gain and loss. In 2019, National Geographic actually acquired these maps and developed them into waterproof booklet-style map sets for hikers to use. Now, while the PCT is so well-traveled and well-signed nowadays, you don't technically need maps for navigation purposes. These maps are incredibly useful for locating campsites or water sources or side trails that provide access to towns or resupply points along the way. So when I finished my hike, uh, I set about building the foundation for my book. I transcribed all of those daily journals that I'd recorded during my hike. I sorted through all 5,000 photos that I took. 
I laid out spreadsheets full of data and stats. I began to experiment with ways to create infographics and maps and illustrations. And I took my transcribed journals and I began to write a manuscript. Three years later, I found out about a writer's conference in Seattle where you could come and pitch book ideas to editors and book agents. By that time, I was living on the other side of the state. So I made the five-hour drive west to Seattle, passing over the Cascade Mountains and the PCT itself, and sat down to give my 10-minute ele elevator pitch to the one editor there who was interested in acquiring nonfiction books. Lucky for me, she shared my affinity for maps and infographics and invited me to compile a book proposal. Three months of nail biting ensued and eventually I had a book deal. So I just wanted to dive into the book at this point and share with you some of the maps and other visuals I created uh, to tell the story of my hike. So here we have the building blocks of the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, constructing a 2,000 mile plus trail is of course a huge undertaking, but luckily there were existing trail systems that served as a foundation. Uh, so the PCT was composed of four already existing trails that I've color-coded on the map here. First, in red here, you have the John Muir Trail, perhaps one of the most beautiful trails in the world, uh, which runs through the High Sierra. Next in yellow, or er, next in orange here, you've got the Tahoe Yosemite Trail, which runs from Yosemite National Park to Lake Tahoe the largest alpine lake in North America. And then in the Pacific Northwest, uh, here in Oregon, in yellow, you have the Oregon Skyline Trail, and in Washington, the Cascade Crest Trail. So it wasn't actually, most of, most of those trails were completed in the early part of the 20th century, and it wasn't until the early 90s that the PCT itself was officially completed to make one continuous path from Mexico to Canada. So what mountain ranges are traveled by the PCT? Well, it's easy enough just to list all of them. There's no way I could resist locating them on a map. There's just so much you can tell at a glance, especially when each range is given a different color. So you can see the cluster of ranges down here, which form the peninsular ranges in Southern California um, that lie so close to the ocean. Then you can see the east to west transverse ranges that we mentioned before. And then there's the big curve of the uh, Sierra Polonas and Tehachapis that cradle the Mojave Desert before entering the Sierra Nevada and continuing on to the Cascade Mountains, which run all the way to Canada with this slight departure into the Klamath Mountains in Northern California. Um, and then to the left here, I've kind of created a simplified version of this and uh, kind of made this color bar which gives you an idea of how much time is spent in each mountain range. And you can clearly see that the PCT hiker is overwhelmingly hiking in the Cascade Mountains more than any other range. So being able to see an elevation profile of the PCT really tells you so much about the trail. You can see uh, its most dramatic change in elevation here, where you're dropping nearly 8,000 feet and then gaining that 8,000 feet back again over the course of only 62 trail miles by dropping down from the San Jacintos, crossing under Interstate 10, and then climbing back up into the San Bernardinos. You can see at what a consistently high elevation you stay in throughout the Sierra Nevada. And then in Northern California, you can see all of these drastic dips down into valleys. And of course, anytime you drop down, you're gonna eventually have to climb back up. And then in Oregon, you'll see that the elevation change is much less extreme, especially when compared to the Sierra Nevada. And it makes it so much easier to hike and cover large distances each day. Um, Again, you can see the drastic drop down to sea level here at the Columbia River. And then going into Washington, it's just the opposite of Oregon with these dramatic ups and downs in the North Cascades. So 
So there are many visuals in my book beyond just maps themselves, and many of them are what are referred to as visual collections. I cataloged all the recurring elements I noticed along the trail, such as trailblazes, wildflowers, or bird feathers, and I presented them in this grid format. It's interesting to see what's idiosyncratic about each item within this common group. In this case, each PCT trailblaze has its own unique personality. Some are weathered, some have been scorched by fire, while others are punctured with bullet holes. And as a graphic designer, I'm intrigued by these sorts of examples of design and man-made elements that you can find out in nature. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these iconic trapezoidal sign shapes used by the Forest Service. So this signage system came, can be traced back to the early 60s and they were created by a man named Virgil Carell. And I found an interesting quote from him about the effect of signs versus the effect of maps. He says, as an, a name of a river on a map can increase in anticipation, but it cannot compare with the excitement that comes with seeing the sign that says Mississippi River, mightiest of all American rivers. So he, of course, was biased. Um, as a designer, I equally love maps and signs, um, particularly vintage signs. And uh, I really was drawn to all of these National Forest Wilderness signs um, they're just this piece of, hum it's a human touch and a bit of graphic design that's tastefully incorporated into an area that's otherwise defined by a lack of human presence. So it was kind of, became like a scavenger hunt collecting these different things. And speaking of man-made elements, uh, another interesting visual item you'll find on a long distance hiking trail are these hiker-made mileage markers. Um, they're composed of rocks, pine cones, bark, sticks, lichen, and they mark each 100 mile increment along the trail. I remember seeing the first 100 mile marker and feeling such a sense of accomplishment. Up to that point, uh, 90 miles was the most I'd hiked uh, in a single go. And I felt such a sense of accomplishment even though I still had 25 of those to go. The 1,000 mile marker and the 2,000 mile marker, of course, were huge accomplishments as well, as was the midpoint of the trail, which is in Northern California. So I, I really loved how these markers seemed to take the mileage points on my maps and superimpose them over my own reality. For many through hikers, the people met along the way are one of the most important aspects of their hike. I created an infographic showing all of the through hikers that I walked with for extended periods of time in the parts of the trail that we hiked together. It adds meaning to my hike to be able to easily see where and for how long I spent time with each of the people I met on the trail. So you can see, for example, that the longest I continuously hiked with someone was 391 miles to the Sierra Nevada. You can also see that, uh, for the most part, many of the people that I met in Southern California I never encountered again throughout the trail. But at the same time, one of the most surprising aspects of through hiking is how after hundreds or thousands of miles, you can be reunited with another hiker you never thought you'd see again. And it's really the trail towns, those little points of civilization that are accessed by the trail, that have this unique way of either reuniting or separating groups of hikers. Um, so it's, you have hikers who come to these trail towns and some may choose to relax and enjoy the comforts of civilization while others might choose to press on and return to the trail. So if you were to take some of these points, uh, like such as these ones here or up here where I either abruptly start hiking with a group of people or abruptly disconnect with them, if you were to superimpose that over a more detailed map, you'd see that it corresponds directly with towns. So when you're hiking the PCT, you'll typically pass through some form of civilization every three to five days or so. Some are larger towns like South Lake Tahoe, and uh, others consist of only a post office and a gas station. Some lay directly along the trail, while others might require an hour-long car ride. 
And believe it or not, hitchhiking is a common way to reach these towns. Uh, I hitchhiked a total of 14 times while through hiking the trail. It's a fact that still kind of freaks me out when I think about it. Uh, I thought it would be interesting not only catalog each town or resupply point along the map, but to give also a visual indication as to how you access them. For example, 32% uh, of them, shown in blue, are located directly on the trail. 17% shown in yellow require just a few miles of additional walking down a side trail or along a two-lane hi two highway. And nearly half of them, shown in red, require hitchhiking. And one of the reasons I took uh, so many photos during my hike is that I would stop to document every wildflower that I found along the way. And after I, I finished my hike, I used an app called iNaturalist to identify each species um, and created this two-page spread showing some of my favorites, you know, from cactus down in Southern California to the alpine flowers of the Pacific Northwest and everything in between. And uh, some of the visual collections, such as wildflowers or the PCT trailblazes, I, I knew I wanted to collect those before I even set out on the trail, but others were more unexpected. Several hundred miles into the hike, I began to notice how many bird feathers I could find lying directly on the trail, and so I began to document them. I found 35 feathers in total, and the most frequently found was the Stellar's Jay, which uh, if you're from the West Coast, you might recognize them. They're like a Western version of the Blue Jay and typically the loudest and most annoying creature in the entire forest. So we don't necessarily think of buildings when we think about hiking trails, but it was fun for me to document each structure that I found along the trail. And, or in the trail towns that I accessed. Some will be recognizable to just about any thru-hiker and may hold quite fond memories, such as the McDonald's in Southern California, which lies almost directly on the trail itself, kind of appearing like a mirage before uh, tired and hungry thru-hikers. And speaking of food, out of everything in my book, this is the page that I think I get the most comments from people. So I ate 135 chocolate bars during my hike and thought it would be fun to show just what that many candy bars looks like. Um, so I, I did eat a fairly healthy diet when I was in trail towns, uh, never mind what I said about McDonald's, but on the trail itself, that was definitely not the case. When you're hiking 12 hours a day every day, you're often just cramming in as many calories as possible. I also cataloged some of the more interesting examples of wildlife that you can encounter. Uh, the trail itself is so busy that you typically will only see a fraction of these, these animals or birds. Uh, rattlesnake sightings are quite common in Southern California, um, but for much of the trail it's, it's typically just deer and chipmunks. Uh, but as I mentioned before, I saw a total of three black bears, one of which I came face to face with as I came around the bend on a trail. And, that bear was just utilizing the trail, like hikers do, as a way to get through the forests and mountains. Uh, lucky, luckily for me, he chose flight over fight. He did a 180 and just hightailed it down the trail off in the other direction. Um, it turns out that typically, uh, when you enter a civilization, uh, dogs tend to be the most dangerous wildlife that you encountered while through hiking, rather than anything out in the wilderness. So uh, elk and mountain goats are also likely encounters in Washington state. And evidence of cougars can be seen on the trail, but rarely the cat itself. And then I, I used all that data that I compiled during my hike, and I organized uh, these charts uh, divided up by the five regions of the trail. And in these bar charts down here at the bottom, uh, you can see such mundane things uh, as how much access I had to flush toilets versus pit toilets versus when I just had to simply dig a hole in the ground to relieve myself, usually called a cat hole. And then 
Up here you see the types of shelter that I utilized each night, which actually says a lot about the experience. Uh, in Southern California here you can see that I spent many nights in a sleeping bag under the stars with nothing over my head. Cowboy camping, as it's called, works well in the desert during springtime, but later on in Oregon, here, where there's swarms of mosquitoes, it doesn't work so well. And in the high elevation of the Sierras, where it's freezing cold at night in June, I was mostly sleeping under a tarp to seal in the warmth. Whereas in July in Northern California, where it's sweltering even at night, it would have been crazy to sleep under a tarp. I also created these bar charts of my daily mileage, um, as well as a number of scenery photographs that I took during my hike each day. So comparing this info can actually tell us a lot about the terrain that I traveled. For example, the number of photos in the High Sierra shot up drastically, while my daily mileage in the High Sierra dropped quite significantly. The breathtaking alpine scenery is, ex of course, extremely photogenic but at the same time, it's extremely difficult to traverse. So there's this inverse relationship between the number of miles hiked and the number of photos taken. In Northern California, where tree cover blocks much of your view, you can see that I took far fewer scenery photographs. And then in Oregon here, you see this drastic uptick in the number of photos I took on one particular day and that was when I was hiking along the rim of Crater Lake. So in the second part of my book, I explore each region of the PCT, and I begin each section with a spread like this one. It includes a simple map uh, highlighting that particular section of the trail in red. And I list a few things like uh, random things like songs that got stuck in my head while I was hiking. Uh, I don't know about you all, but when I hike, some of the most random songs just kind of pop into my head and just stick around for the entire day and, re and drive me crazy. So one day it might be Phil Collins, or the next day it's the jingle from the Hot Pockets commercial. It's, uh... As I mentioned before, uh, for the most part, maps are not necessary for navigation of the PCT, but they do serve many other purposes one of which is knowing all of the toponyms in the area, you know, the names for the mountains and the lakes and the rivers. And I list my favorites here. And there's so many good ones along the PCT, and to me they're like poetry. You have Bucksnort Mountain, Cigarette Hills, Horse Thief Canyon, Perspiration Point, Cup Lake, which is right next to Saucer Lake, Burning Moscow Spring, and perhaps my favorite, the Inconsolable Range. Sometimes a toponym will even cause a song to get stuck in your head, like when I noticed Young America Lake on the map, causing David Bowie's Young Americans to be stuck in my head for the rest of the day. So if you'll begrudge me one final Steinbeck quote, he has this to say about toponyms. The names of places carry a charge of the people who name them, reverent or irreverent, descriptive, either poetic or disparaging. You can name anything San Lorenzo, but Shirt Hill Canyon or the Lame Moor is something quite different. So these place names often tell a story, and I included a few of those in my book. Um, for example, there's Battle Creek, named for a battle between a burrow named Barney and a mountain lion. Barney was said to be the victor. There's Bear Paw Meadow, named by early stockmen who found a bear paw nailed to a tree. Happy Gap, named for the elation a 19th century prospector would feel upon finally getting a train of pack mules to reach this pass. And then there's Hell for Sure Pass, named for the difficulty of this rough, rough sheep trail. There's Sardine Lake, where a mule carrying canned sardines had fallen off, fallen off the trail and perished in the lake. And then there's Dinky Creek, named for Dinky, a little dog that fought a grizzly bear at the creek in 1863. I didn't see any info as to who was the victor, but I'm guessing things didn't end well for Dinky. I also created maps for each region and tried to pack in as much information about my experience as I could. I've noted major landmarks and towns as well as memorable experiences, such as the time I saw cougar tracks on the trail or 
the worst day for mosquitoes on my entire hike. I show how much of the trail I covered each day, along with the corresponding mileage, the weather, the phases of the moon. On this map of Central California, I've highlighted the longest roadless stretch in the PCT, shown in yellow here, which is 238 miles through the High Sierra. And then on this map of Oregon, I've highlighted in red the most difficult dry stretch and my thirstiest time on the trail, which lasted about 27 miles. In yellow here, I've highlighted my biggest mile day on the entire trail, which was 35.2 miles. So one of the most iconic parts of the PCT is the High Sierra of Central California. It's often snow covered and requires nonstop physical exertion, a very difficult prospect when you're so high in elevation and the air is so thin. So each day is basically the same. You climb for most of the day, you reach a high pass in the afternoon, then you spend the rest of the day descending down into a low valley where you camp for the night. The next day you wake up, climb out of the valley and reach another high pass. Then repeat until you've crossed over five major passes of the High Sierra. So I created this spread of infographics locating the high passes on a map, showing their elevation profile and showing the view of each one as you approach it with its name, elevation and mile point along the trail. And it's interesting to me how looking at a map or even just a simple elevation profile like this can bring back so many vivid memories from this experience because just in my mind when I think back it's just kind of this jumbled mess of you know extreme exertion and just gorgeous scenery but when I look at this elevation profile I can kind of make sense of all those memories and I can remember what it's like to slog up to that first pass along the way you know what the snow felt like under my feet how tired I was descending down into one of those valleys and just how wonderful it felt to climb into my sleeping bag at the end of the night. So this particular infographic depicts the elevation changes through the Sierra using a gradient uh, from dark green, showing the lower elevations down to 6,000 feet, to white, showing the highest elevations up to 13,000 feet. I matched it up to the trail's route where you can see the white part of the gradient bar aligned with each of the high passes and the dark green aligned with the, the valleys below. On the following spread, I simplified this gradient and grouped together the various elevation ranges that one reaches. And from this graphic, it becomes clear that the majority of the hiker's time is spent between 10,000 and 11,000 feet with only a fraction of that time spent below 7,000 feet or above 12,000 feet. So um, Northern California was for me probably the most mentally difficult uh, part of the trail. You know, I mentioned the lack of scenery. You're hiking in tree cover a lot of the time. Uh, it's just, you know, it's typically July when you're passing through there, it's extremely hot. Uh, there's lots of logging roads, uh, and it's just after this iconic experience of the Sierras, it's kind of like, uh, just kind of pales in comparison. So Mount Shasta kind of became uh, a beacon of hope for me along the way, and it's, it's a feature that hikers can see for nearly 500 miles nonstop. Um, and it kind of continued, kind of motivated me to continue hiking. And it really is a truly unique experience to be able to same, see the same landmark on the horizon for such a long time. Um, when there's such an imposing feature on the landscape, it gives you a sense of your progress. You know, as the volcano grows larger each day and then slowly recedes behind you back towards the horizon. And here I've depicted uh, various views of Mount Shasta, a nod to the Japanese artist Hokusai and his 36 views of Mount Fuji as well as a map here locating the location of each of those viewpoints. And so you, the first view of the, trail, or the mountain from the trail is down here in Northern California from a place called Hat Creek Rim. And then the final view is all the way up near Crater Lake in Oregon. Actually, the mountain was actually visible for 23 total days uh, from July 5th to July 22nd. And Shasta, of course, 
is a volcano. And for me, one of the most unique features of the PCT when compared to other long distance hiking trails is this string of volcanoes that go from Northern California up to Canada. So I, I included an illustration of each volcano along with their profiles set to, st to scale. And also notice, notice the elevation and the original native name and corresponding tribe. So again, I could have just listed the volcanoes and their elevations, but it's so much more interesting to me to see them in relation to each other here, visually. It's hard to explain, but there's a part of me that likes to see things organized in a visual way. It's like this compulsion to give some sort of visual order to the things that I witnessed during my time on the trail. Uh, and I also included these satellite views of many of the volcanoes to create this abstract grid of white snow fields and glaciers, as well as the bright blue of Crater Lake. So uh, returning again to the idea of toponyms, I'd like to mention a man by the name of Albert Sylvester, who is credited with naming over 1,000 natural features in Washington's Cascade Range. As national forests proliferated, it became necessary to create more detailed maps and create place names as well, mostly in the interest of fighting forest fires. In the early 20th century, many places in the Cascades had never been explored by white settlers. So during that time period, Albert Sylvester found himself in both the adventurous and creative role of both exploring and naming the backcountry. Given complete freedom in his creation of toponyms, and he adopted several standard conventions in his naming. So sometimes you would follow a pattern. So see if you can guess the connection here. We've got Bryant Peak, Irving Peak, Whittier Peak, Longfellow Mountain, and Poe Mountain, which were all named for American poets. Other times he named features for something that happened there. Dishpan Gap is named for a rusty dishpan found at the terminus of a popular sheep herders trail. Kodak Peak was named because his assistant lost a Kodak camera there. And Tin Pan Mountain was named for no other reason than, quote, it was just a name for a place needing naming. And some of his names were even inspired by the maps themselves. Labyrinth, Ma Labyrinth Mountain was named for its dense network of topog topographical contour lines on the map. And then two nearby lakes were named Minotaur Lake and Theseus Lake. And then Lake Janus was named for, after the two-faced Roman god who Sylvester discovered, um, because Sylvester discovered that the lake uh, shown in older maps as draining to the west actually drained to the east. And it's also important to acknowledge that many of the places pa traveled by the PCT were already named by native peoples long before anyone of European descent quote unquote discovered them. So I use this map to acknowledge the native lands traveled by the PCT. And these boundaries are much more fluid, and so I chose to pinpoint general areas on the map. And I'll just share one final uh, visual collection with you here. In Oregon, through hikers begin to discover relics from the past. These are vintage diamond-shaped PCT blazes nailed to the trees. Some of these 80-year-old enameled signs are rusted, others faded, and some simply monochromatic. Their paint long since worn away. Some are covered in sap and some are barely visible, partially covered with bark and having been nearly swallowed by the tree itself. And again, I've created a visual grid of these old signs and I've located them on a map. Um, so I've actually, since then, I've realized that after seeing photos taken by other hikers, I really only saw about half of the existing uh, vintage signs out there as there are many on the north side of the tree which are only visible to those hiking south, so <laughs> I'll just have to hike the trail again so I can catalog them all. Um, so an early draft of my book had the working title, A Trail of Innumerable Meanings, which is a quote from John Steinbeck. This title captured for me the idea that through hiking is an endeavor uh, comprised of opposing experiences. There's excitement balanced with monotony. There's a great sense of freedom, even though you're bound to a predetermined route to, full of numerous things that are just completely out of your control, whether that be weather, wildfire, 
uh, dry stretches. Uh, you can exist fully in the moment while at other times you yearn for what lies further down the trail. It's a slowing down of life while walking a marathon's length each day. It's quiet introspection mixed with the camaraderie, camaraderie of other hikers. Uh, in the same way, I hope that there's a sense of duality in my book. It's both universal and personal in scope. It captures both the world around me and the world inside my head. And it contains detailed data alongside humorous and poetic observations. So when I finished my through hike, I still had to make it back to civilization, which requires an additional eight miles of walking uh, to get to Highway 3 in Canada, where there's a provincial park and a small resort. So that evening in my hotel room, uh, the movie Adaptation was playing on TV. It's a movie that I liked, but I'd, I'd seen it several times before, so it mostly just kind of played in the background. But at one instance, uh, Meryl Streep delivers, delivers a monologue that caught my attention and I paused to listen to it. Most people yearn for something exceptional, she spoke. Something so inspiring that they'd want to risk everything for that passion, but few would act on it. She continued, there are too many ideas and things and people, too many directions to go. The reason it matters to care passionately about something is that it whittles the world down to a more manageable size. So for two years, I whittled the world down to encompass only the PCT as I planned for this hike. I found the notion of the PCT so inspiring that I quit my job, I moved out of my apartment, and I put all my possessions into a tiny storage unit. Sometimes there are just too many directions to go in life. And at that time, I had no idea what direction to take. I'd constructed maps to tell other people's stories, but I hadn't yet been able to construct a road map for my own life or for my future. So I simply picked one direction, north towards Canada. But my passion ultimately led me to create this book, which helped me to rekindle my love for graphic design. And all of this in turn led me here to speak with all of you. I love what that Meryl Streep character says in the film about caring so passionately about something um, and how it whittles the world down to a more manageable size. Uh, you could perhaps say the same thing about maps. And of course, they also open up the world, open up new worlds for discovery. I hope that these maps and other visuals help to make my story of a nearly 3,000 mile hike in the five months it took to complete it more manageable and more digestible, while also inspiring others to perhaps discover it on their own, whether it be for one day or 100 days. So you all are gathered here to celebrate your passion for maps, and you've been lucky enough to build careers around that passion. I, for one, am honored to have had the chance to speak with you, and I'm excited to share in your passion over the coming days. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to all of your great presentations. Thank you.